Hello and welcome to this episode of the Seattle Podcasters Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Rigdon. On this episode, we have Brent Lines of the Solving Sounds Podcast. But first, I have this quick message. I just want to take a moment here and tell you about the Seattle Podcasters Guild. You'll probably hear us mention the Guild a couple times on this episode. It's a new group of podcasters that are getting together just about every month. We're getting together up at um, Optimism Brewing on Capitol Hill. We just try to get together and have some fun and talk about podcasting, do a little networking, try to figure out you know how we can help each other. Um, if you want more details about the Seattle Podcasters Guild, just go to seattlepodcasters.com and all the information will be right there. So I'm here with Brent Lyons of Solving Sounds. How are you today? I'm doing great. How are you doing, Jason? Doing pretty good. So could you tell me a little bit about your podcast? Yeah. Um, so uh, basically, so I'm a musician and um, I've always kind of felt like I was a bit of a fraud. Like I'm not like a real musician, or at least I don't feel like one. Like um, I took music lessons and, and things like that from teachers, but I kind of fudged a lot of things and always kind of figured things out of my own in a weird way. And I kind of wondered if other musicians felt the same way. And so I thought it would be really interesting to interview other musicians and kind of figure out how they figured everything out around music, whether it's like learning to play instruments, how they figured out how to write their own songs or kind of navigate being in bands, recruiting other people or recording albums in a studio. I just thought as a music fan, that would be super interesting to hear. Um, there's another podcast called um, Song Exploder. And um, yeah, it's a pretty well-known podcast. And um, they talk a lot about one specific song where they dive super deep into how that song was written. And I thought that was really cool, but I kind of wanted to approach that that same style with a musician's entire career, um, just diving into the super details and doing it in a way that would be interesting to other musicians and also just music fans, people that are interested in music. So that's that's kind of how I got started, and that's that's what it's about. Well, it's also very interesting just on uh, the creative side of it, just hearing people talk about the creative process. Yeah, yeah, and uh, different people approach the same thing in so many different ways that's really inspiring too just to kind of hear their jumping off points or their foundations and kind of how they ended up where they were you know i've i've only done uh 10 interviews so far so i'm still fairly new to it but uh there has not been any sort of repeats you know it's uh, everyone has their own original story and their own original approach and that's always been super interesting um to me just just as a listener, you know, it's sort of, I would say I started this podcast partially for selfish reasons, you know, just um, to entertain myself or just kind of really have a chance to sit down with someone and kind of ask them everything I've ever wanted to know. It, it's interesting. Um, I've found, especially as I've gotten older, it's kind of hard just to get people to commit to things or just kind of get in a room with someone and, and, and hang out. And I've found that um, doing a podcast and doing these interviews is a great sort of excuse. Like, oh, this is a very official thing we're doing that we need to carve out time to do. And so it's been great. I've been able to take a lot of people that I would say I was sort of acquaintances with before that I've kind of seen around in the local music scene and just kind of sit them down and just really like dive in deep on everything I've ever wanted to know about them. And how long have you been doing this show? I've only been doing it for about five months. I started in September, um, but I've been listening to podcasts for a really long time. And uh, I don't know, I just, I I don't want to pat myself on the back or anything, but uh, I was kind of surprised at how natural it felt to me. Like, um, I've always been really good about talking to people one-on-one, -on -one, even if it's someone I don't have a lot of commonality with, you know, like in large groups, I kind of tend to just listen more than I talk, but I've I, I think I'm pretty good about um, engaging with someone one on one. I can just kind of dial into whatever they're about. So um, yeah, I, I feel like I've been able to kind of jump in, and and it's been great because there's been so many resources as well. Like you're a great example of that with the um, Seattle Podcasters Guild, where once I did get started in podcasting, I was able to kind of get all my questions answered really quickly just because there's so many people in the community that have been doing it for so long and are so helpful. And um, it's interesting too, when it comes to like gear and things, I know a lot of podcasters are really into gear. Um, 
I kind of built my recording stuff around um, what a musician would want because I'm a musician. And so when I bought like my latest laptop and my um, my uh, recording equipment, it was around like, well, what would be great for recording demos? And then I was like 90% there. And then I just got some like decent vocal mics. And I was like, oh, great. Now I'm ready to podcast. And so had you done any podcasts before this one? No, this is my first one. Oh, wow. Yeah, because you sound so natural on it and so prepared. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks a lot. I try to really do my homework. Um, it's kind of interesting. It's a lot like uh, songwriting or just creativity in general, where I try to prepare as much as I can beforehand. Um, normally, that just means like listening to um, a particular musician's like creative output, like listening to all their albums and things and um maybe like checking out their social media. And um, I actually write notes to myself. Like I write kind of like a loose kind of map of how I want the interview to go or sort of the key points I want to hit. And I kind of have it with me while I'm doing the interview, but I found I rarely need it because I kind of just remember from doing it. And I, but when I'm doing the interview itself, I want to leave room for, whatever to happen to happen. Like, I don't want to sort of push the interview too much to where the, the interviewee feels kind of uh, stifled or something. So I, I, I try to really um, just do the homework in advance. So I'm kind of ready, but then once it's happening, just kind of let whatever happens happens. I've found that that's a really good way for me, at least to have kind of um, an honest and deep conversation with somebody. Yeah. You seem to have a really good balance with that. It's kind of hard to know which side to go on Mm -hmm. can you yeah um oh go ahead can you give me just a minute i have a very sad cat that's outside the door that i need to get oh no yeah absolutely hey honey i'm in here hey honey come here come here come here look 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 all right yeah i even got you your blankie yeah I think you should leave all this in. I don't think you should edit, edit any of this out. Sorry about that. <laughs> I, I think I think you should leave all that in. I don't think you should edit any of that. I'm being serious. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've got yeah. like a special towel that I keep for recording that they can lay on. And I hope Aww. they don't fight. But <laughs> That's, it's funny. I have two cats as well. Mm-hmm. And um, sometimes when I'm in my like I don't know office or whatever doing my thing and they hear me talk they'll like scratch at the door yeah. to like get in or put their paws underneath the door and you can like it's like audible it, like the mic yep. picks it up you know <laughs> yeah you're like can I give you some treats that's why I have like I found this one towel that they really like to lay on and I basically keep it away from them unless yeah. I'm recording <laughs> mm-hmm. and I try to make it like a big deal about look the blankie's coming out look look <laughs> yeah, it's a special treat <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> yeah this is all gold dude you should leave this in <laughs> yeah. so let's see uh where was I oh uh, let's see well let's go uh let's go with um oh let's go so what's been your biggest challenge of doing this show uh Honestly, the biggest challenge is my own insecurity, I would say, um, just because I've, I would always consider myself uh, to be an introverted person. I'm not super comfortable with being in the spotlight or um, people looking at me or just being like the center of attention. It, it, it's funny. Um, I've thought about doing a live podcast, um, but then the idea of an audience and people looking at me while I'm talking <laughs> kind of scares the crap out of me. But it's it's hilarious because there's this sort of uh, vague disconnect where I can speak into a microphone. You know, I'm just sitting by myself right now with a microphone and I feel totally fine saying whatever. And I know that people will hear this, <laughs> you know, so it's essentially the same thing, me talking and then their ears listening. But there's, I don't know, something about my brain, like where I see them looking at me, where I kind of freeze up. Um, so, and, and just like public speaking in general has never really been my bag. You know, I've never really gravitated towards it. And, you know, I've always sort of hated my own voice, you know, hearing, hearing your own voice in the playback was kind of rough. And I think it is for most people, but um, it's been cool because the longer I've been doing it, 
I don't know if it's just repetition or what it is, but you just kind of like make peace with it after a while. And it's like, yeah, I'm just kind of nasally and whiny and have a little bit of a lisp. And that's the way it's always been. People <laughs> haven't like burst out laughing when I start talking to them. So it's like my voice can't be nearly as bad as I think it is. But um, I would honestly say that was my biggest, my biggest challenge was just sort of like getting over myself and just thinking, you know, I deserve to have a podcast and put content out and have it be at a quality where it's worth listening to, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a shame. I, a lot of people, you know, want to start podcasting and even buy all the equipment. But when I talk to folks, there's a lot of, um, there's a very big phenomenon of like delaying and procrastinating because of those mm -hmm. things. I don't like how my voice sounds. I feel uncomfortable. It's like being on stage. There's all these things yeah. and you just have to kind of jump in and just, if once you do it a few times, you you start worrying about all kinds of other things. <laughs> well, and you quickly realize that no one cares. Like, yeah. I mean that in a good way. Like, mm -hmm. um, I remember in my first couple episodes, I was like, oh, I said something. I, like, revealed something embarrassing about myself. Or mm -hmm. I, like, said the wrong word. Like, I was talking to a friend uh, who was in a metal band. And they were called Iron Dragon. And I said, so tell me about when you were an Iron Maiden. And he was like, what? I wasn't a Maiden. I would have loved you. And I was like, wait, what did I say? And and he was like, Iron Dragon. And I, when I was editing it, I almost cut it out. I was like 90% going to edit this out. Just me looking stupid, right? Saying the wrong word. But for whatever reason, I was like, uh, maybe there's like some sort of truth in this vulnerability. You know, it's like I should just, you know, accept it and just put it out there but i was like kind of nervous about it. i was like oh i'm gonna like hear about this you know how i like messed up and you know no one cared no no one said anything about it you know it's just and it's sort of um refreshing in a way you know you get so locked into just oh what are people gonna think and oh like i was saying earlier it's like i'm a fraud they're gonna figure out like i'm no good i don't deserve to be here and and the podcast has really helped me a lot just in terms of getting used to my own voice and um, just being okay with uh, making mistakes and putting those mistakes out there. And a lot of times it's funny. It's like the more vulnerable you are and the more you put yourself out there and show your scars and your insecurities, it's like the more people accept you and respond yeah. to you in a positive way. So it's really sort of counterintuitive. But I agree. It's like once you get started, you, you start to see it and it's... Um, inspiring it makes you want to do more it's like oh well if this is okay like what if i say this or what if i do this or what if i have this guest on you know and um it's exciting because it kind of starts to push you towards just new things that maybe you wouldn't have done before yeah i think people kind of strive for both perfection and authenticity and i don't know if you can have both at the same time i think you need to have those flaws to build that authenticity yeah, it's funny. I've uh, talked to a couple other podcasters who get real deep in the editing. And I'm just not that way. Like I, I, I spend a lot of time kind of figuring out where to like cut in and cut out of the interview. Like I, I'm not a big fan of like, okay, we're starting. It's official now. Like I um, listen to Pete Holmes's podcast, you made it weird. And he just has the mics on before the him and the guest even get in the room so like you hear them kind of in the background for the first like 20 seconds kind of like mm -hmm. fumbling around and sitting down and stuff and i really like that sort of natural flow so i, I kind of spend some time figuring out where i want to cut in but i rarely ever edit an episode there's like a couple times where like people need to like go to the bathroom and stuff and it's just like dead air like of course i'll cut that out but um but i've heard some other podcasters who get real nitpicky about ums and ahs and long pauses and i think that just goes back to vulnerability and authenticity you know it's like i think people want to be a part of the conversation and and i think leaving all those long pauses and things in helps create that that feeling because it's real and some people that's the way they talk it's kind of like their feature yeah. the way they speak it has those kind of pauses a certain rhythm to it and if you edit that out it sounds like it's a different person. Yeah. And I think people can tell because it starts to sound kind of choppy and it's kind of funny. It's like um, TV editing with like reality shows. Yeah. It's always like bing, bang, boom, real like um, ADD, like, yeah. oh, it's something new right in your face all the time. Yeah. And um, I think people have really responded to the long form interviews and podcasting. When you think of like Mark Marin and, you know, Pete Holmes, these types of people that have like, I don't know, I think Pete Holmes his podcasts are like two or three hours or something like that. And uh, I love it. Yeah. I definitely think that 
there's that um strange effect i think it's like the jump cut like on youtube you'll see and you'll hear that in some podcasts and i i know i have been guilty of that before <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah you see that a lot in youtube it's almost um i don't know like a I don't know how to say it's like a graphic artistic choice or something. It's, it has nothing to do almost with the pause. It's just sort of like a, a beat. I don't know. It's just like a, a move, a thing. It's like a, a graphic or something. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, no, no, totally. <laughs> so what have been some yeah. of the biggest rewards of doing this show? Um, just hearing from people that I respect liking the podcast, yeah. um, <laughs> just uh, getting responses from people like in the music, community that's meant the most um i remember after my first episode i heard from someone who was good friends with my guest and i remember she told me that she had been friends with this this person for like 10 years or something and even she learned a bunch from uh, the interview and that meant a ton to me i was like wow i was able to kind of yeah. crack the shell and kind of get some like deep truths that even this this person who had been friends with my guest for so long didn't even know that was that was super exciting and um yeah it's it's just been really nice to hear other people say that they got something out of it and um that's that's honestly the best part for me and then i already kind of talked about the personal rewards of just kind of getting more confidence and getting more excited about doing it. So I, I would say those were the biggest rewards. You don't run any ads or ask for any donations or anything. No, well, well, no one's uh, offering <laughs> to put an ad on my show. So I should say, you know, it's not like, you know, they're beating the door down yeah. and I'm comfortable. You know, it's pretty easy to not have ads when uh, no one wants to be on your show. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I said like in one of my intros that I would never do like the Patreon thing, yeah. you know, where you ask people for money. Um, when it comes to ads, I don't know. It hasn't been an issue yet. Um, I mean, I it, this kind of, again, goes back to my um, musical career. When I was like in my mid 20s, I was like, sure, I was going to be a rock star. Or I was I would say I would I was putting all my energy into being a rock star. I was like, this is the path. This is what I want to do. And my band broke up. And this was the band that I had poured, you know, my heart and soul into, you know, I was like doing everything to like get shows and put posters up and, you know, playing like Wednesday night at 1am to two people knowing I have to like wake up at 6am the next day, like that kind of stuff. And when that band broke up, I, I kind of changed my perspective and And I was like, you know what, it's it's okay to have a day job, you know, it's not the end of the world, especially if you can find something that you like doing, or you work for good people or people that you like. And um, I just decided that at that point, I was going to do exactly what I wanted with music all the time. And I was never going to make concessions to where I would like stay in bands because I think they're going to be successful or make money. And that's kind of the same approach I've taken to podcasting. Like, I'm doing this 100% for me. Just, I, I, I think that's so important when it comes to creativity in general. You should enjoy the doing of the thing. Like, that should be its own reward. And with podcasting, that's totally been the case for me. I love creating it. I love doing the interviews and I love the response. So to me, it's like money and and like running ads and, and these types of things. It's like, eh, it just... I don't know. It, it it just isn't important to me. Yeah, that's a great attitude to have. I mean, I talk to people all the time that, you know, want the ads and they want the donations and there's all these courses to take on it. But it just, Ugh. I don't know, I think it kind of just kind of leads to unhappiness a lot of times. Yeah, and I think once your art becomes your livelihood, your relationship to it changes because now you're sort of like a slave to yeah. it and it can take a lot of the joy out of it. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. So we're yeah. so let's see, we're going to get more into the uh, technical side of things. So where do you host oh, your boy. episodes? Uh, it's cool. Um, when I was buying my gear, I was originally going to buy a desktop computer, but sort of at the last minute when I realized I was going to do podcasting, I was like, oh, why don't I get a laptop so I can be mobile? Um, so what ends up happening is I always offer to go to wherever my guests are. Um, and that happens about 50% of the time. And the other 50%, they just want to come to uh, my house where I record my podcast, um, which is great because I'm already set up. But um, I, I think going back to 
um, having those deep conversations with people, I found that in environment is super important. And so if I can go to where they kind of have set up their own creative space, um, I just have found it's easier to kind of get them to be comfortable yeah. and open up more. And it's, it's cool for me as a host just to kind of see their practice space or their recording studios or whatever. Um, but I mean, it is nice when they just come over here and I don't have to do anything. <laughs> so, uh, so it's about 50, 50 where I host. And so you have a mobile rig you have set up. Yeah. I don't have like uh, a handheld recorder or anything, mm -hmm. but I have, um, a uh, MacBook Pro for my laptop, and then I use a uh, Focusrite Scarlet. I think it's um, an 18i8 is the mm -hmm. model. And um, it's funny, that just went back to me recording music, and I wanted to be able to record drums. And this particular model has four um, line inputs that you can... So you can do four tracks at once. So I was like, oh, this will be great for miking drums. Um, and then I just use it for podcasting as well. There's a smaller model that just has two inputs that would probably be... A little bit more ideal for podcasting just because it's lighter and easier to carry around but um that's about it and then for microphones i just use uh sure uh sm7b's and a lot of that was just because i i was a fan of a lot of podcasts and then when i decided i was going to do my own i would start looking at their like instagram yeah, totally. <laughs> uh, accounts and things and i just saw like joe rogan and um who's the other one um uh the uh dak shepherd was the other one um and they all seem to use these sure mics and I recognize them um, for being vocal mics for um, music and things. So I was like, yeah, I'll just use those. And so how about how long do you think your post-production takes of like editing it down? It, it doesn't take too long. I would say maybe between an hour and an hour and a half. Um, I, so how it works is I have like, you know, the music cues and then I have the intro where it's me talking and kind of setting the interview up and then like 98% of it is the interview. And I always wait to do the intro until after I've done the editing and kind of listen back to the interview. Cause I want to have it fresh in my mind because most of the time I'll like want to, it'll remind me of something or I'll want to comment on something that was said. Um, I'm trying to get better about references. I realized early on we'd be talking about specific things that if you weren't in like the Seattle music scene, you wouldn't know what we were talking about. Like we would talk about like a very specific studio or something like that, where it's like, okay, 99% of people don't know what that is. Um, so, uh, so most of the time I would start just by editing the interview and I just would do some sort of light compression EQ, that kind of stuff. I don't get too crazy. I'm not a big like techie person. Um, and then after I would do that, I would go back and record the intro um, just because the interview is fresh in my mind and I feel like I can uh, comment on it or maybe say something relevant to kind of set that up. Um, and then I just insert the little music cues and things and then I upload. And it's funny, um, I think this is true for a lot of podcasters, but uh, writing the show notes mm. takes me a long time. And I don't even write, I write like maybe a paragraph. But for whatever reason, this seems to be like the most brutal part of it for me that I kind of slave over. Um, so I would kind of include that in the editing process as well. I totally feel you, the show notes. I never know what to write. I'm like, yeah, yeah like sometimes either. there's like, um, well, maybe like references you're saying or certain things that we talk about, like a certain microphone or something. And then I would put a little link in there, but I don't know what else mm -hmm. to put. <laughs> it's funny. I kind of started this thing where I'd say, you know, on this week's, it's why I try to start different too. Cause I realized I kept saying like today on the podcast and I'd like, look, at my history and like every show note started with today on the yeah. podcast. I was like, Oh, I don't like that. I want to like mix that up. And then I s would say we have so-and-so on and they tell us about, and then I would list like three things. And then the third one, I'd always try to make like a funny thing. <laughs> and then <laughs> like the fifth or sixth one. And I was just like, Ugh, why did I do this to my, why did I create this mm -hmm. model that I have to follow now where I'm like, okay, what's funny? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Well, and the sad part is a lot of time listeners don't even look at the show notes at all. And you'll be like, they'll ask you a question. Yeah. You're like, oh, it's in the show notes. And like, oh, mm -hmm. and like, okay. <laughs> yeah. And um, I don't know if you were planning on asking about this, but um, I kind of go back and forth about um, doing the uh, self-promotion in the promos. Uh there's been a few where I'd be like, hey, you know, it really helps out if you subscribe and review on iTunes and I'd list like the social media links. And um, 
I don't know. I, d- I didn't really enjoy doing that. I don't think anyone really does, but I know it's like super important. So I found just throwing those on the end of every um, show note helps okay. a lot just because it's one tap. You know, it's like if they want to follow you on Facebook, they can totally. just tap the link and boom, they're there. So um, that's been a really good use of the show notes that I've found. Yeah. So do you have any tips or um, comments about what you've done to promote the show? Yeah, I've actually uh, tried a lot of things. It, it's funny, before I started the podcast, you know, I was saying earlier, it's like, I'm just doing this for me. And, you know, it's, I enjoy just doing it. And that's all great. And whatever, if people listen, it's great if they don't. You know, I know everyone says that. And I, I said it too. I was like, yeah, if just one person listens, like, that's enough, like all that kind of stuff. Um, but once I released an episode, I was shocked at how much I cared yeah about the numbers and just how often I would hit that refresh <laughs> button to see like, did anyone listen to any more downloads, you know? And, um, you know, to be honest with you, I, be- I became a little obsessed with the numbers and uh, I became a little like competitive and I was like, I just, I want more people to listen, you know? And I was getting good feedback and I w- was feeling like what I was putting out was, was good. And so I wanted people to hear it. So I, I, I tried some, some different things and um, I tried, a Spotify ad. I don't know if um, anyone's talked about that, but I I was really trying to think of where my audience would be. And I was thinking Spotify is great because they're all about music and they started doing podcasting a couple years ago. So if they're listening to Spotify and they hear a promo for my show, it's just one tap, boom, they're still in the Spotify app, but now they're listening to my podcast. So I thought that was kind of a clever... Mm-hmm. Um, advertising approach, but I found that it did not help my numbers oh, no. very much at all. Okay. Um, I was kind of shocked. Um, another thing I tried was, um, do you know the Stranger magazine in yes. Seattle? Yeah, I I kind of thought the same thing. I was like, okay, the people that read the Stranger are a lot of times really interested in music because that's like a, one of the main features of the magazine. So if I can get, um, and a lot of times. Um, I do this in bands where if I had a big show, like an album release, I would take out like an eighth of a page ad in the stranger to promote it. And a lot of music venues around town um, would do that where they would just post their, their calendar in the stranger magazine. So I was like, Oh, I bet um, that would be a good spot for me to, to advertise because the people that like the stranger, that's sort of my audience. And again, like I was kind of, surprised at how little that actually ended up helping um i think some of it is because it's not easy yeah. like i think if they were just on their phones and it was just like one tap boom you're like there it'd be easier but i think because it was like you know a paper magazine that you're looking at then you have to pick up your phone and open up you know your podcasting app and then go search for it i think that might have hurt it a little bit um and I've tried a few other things that have actually been more successful. I um, did a, um, what do you call it? Just a, a, an ad, I guess. I did an ad on the Overcast mm-hmm. app. Yeah, do you know that yeah, app? Totally. Yeah. Um, so instead of Spotify, which is like a 30 second promo where you record, like a, it's like a little commercial where you record like, hey, this is what my podcast is about. And you, know, you have like background music and stuff. Overcast just has um, a banner underneath the controls, like the play and rewind or whatever. And um, it just has a, your thumbnail and just like a little one or two sentence thing about what your podcast is about. And for whatever reason, that's been r- working really well for me. Um, I think part of it is because there's different categories that you can um, advertise in. And they had a music section and a lot of... Um, the slots were available because I, I don't see a ton of other music podcasts. Um, so I was able to get in and I think just being in that category and for whatever reason, just the banner and maybe the fact that you can just tap the banner and boom, you're there. That's been working um, really well for me. Um, beyond that, um, actually, this is another like plug for the uh, Seattle Podcasters mm-hmm. Guild. Um, <laughs> I went to the first meetup last month and that helped a ton just because I was able to meet other podcasters and um, just kind of uh, share stories. But also a lot of people were looking for guests and kind of cross promoting Mm -hmm. Um, this kind of being one of them. I've, I've, I think um, going on other podcasts is super great um, because the people that listen already 
you know, know what podcasts are. They already have their app. They're ready to go. And if they like you as a guest, it's super easy for them to find you. So I think that is maybe like the number one thing. But um, I think networking with other podcasters, especially locally, I think that helps a lot. Um, I think that really helps with advertising your podcast. So do you have any advice for people maybe thinking about starting a podcast? Um, it's become sort of a cliche. I know a lot of people say this, but I would say just uh, get started. You know, a lot of times people want to wait until everything's perfect and they have all the perfect gear and they know exactly what they're going to do. And I don't know, it might go back to like the insecurity thing where they don't want to like put anything out there that they think is imperfect. But the problem is you you rarely ever get to the point where you feel good enough that it is perfect. Um, I wish I had started podcasting, you know, like six months earlier when I was first thinking about it. It kind of took me a while to wrap my mind around it. Kind of like what I was saying earlier. It's like, does anyone care what I say? You know what I mean? Um, and uh, I, I kind of know everyone says this, but it's the truth. Um, yeah, just just do it. Just start. Even if you don't think it's perfect, um, just starting it is good because you learn so much and then you know your future episodes are great too and and it's just it's just good to get started that's what i would say and so do you spend any time like uh keeping up with like podcast industry news um i joined a bunch of facebook groups just to kind of see what's going on and i've had kind of mixed results with that um a lot of times they're very techy you know they want to know about like microphones and things like this and (laughs) that just doesn't interest me at all and um i've been kind of shocked at what i've seen a lot of podcast topics be about like i'm kind of blown away that there's so many quote-unquote entrepreneur podcasts like i just feel like that's a bit of a racket like suddenly everyone's like a life coach you you know know why there's so many of those entrepreneur podcasts is because a lot of those guests will pay you money to interview them oh i didn't know that (laughs) they don't like to talk about it but it's going to be a big topic i think this summer oh man yeah yeah. you broke that wide (laughs) open i had to know that and it's it's funny because yeah everyone's like doing the self-promotion thing where it's like yeah have me on uh, as a guest on your podcast like i'm a spiritual healer and a life coach and uh, i'm a motivator self-starter and you know you want to be a successful business person and entrepreneur you know i just see that over and Mm -hmm. over and over again so you said you were a big podcast listener right yeah so um how do you discover new shows um that's a good question uh a lot of times it's the guest. Like um, I love uh, it's always sunny in Philadelphia, and I I follow Caitlin Olson who plays D on the show, and she like never does long form interviews or press or podcasts that I was aware of, and she went on Dak Shepard's podcast because um, I guess they were old friends. They were on like an improv team like way before they were famous, and so I listened to that that podcast um dax's podcast because i am interested in her and it's funny with dax in particular i always thought he was kind of a douche you know like i knew him from like punked and i just always thought he was kind of like a jock and just kind of i don't know i just didn't like him and it actually this was kind of an inspiration too for me starting was i listened i loved his interview with caitlin and then i started going through his other interviews i was like oh he's really good at this and then i listened to more interviews that he had done and it was great and i started subscribing and i listened to every single one and i kind of fell in love (laughs) with the guy at the end like his approach to life and just how he was kind of talking about things i was like wow i went from thinking this guy is you know not that great to really liking him and his point of view um so that that's kind of one way um another is really word of mouth um that's how i discovered uh the dollop which is um just uh it's a comedy podcast where uh these two comedians one of them tells a story from history and the other kind of like reacts to it and uh it's to me for whatever reason i don't know if it's their format or whatever but it's the perfect like binge podcast and someone had recommended this to me before i had to do this two day like eight hours each day road trip and i just binged i probably listened to like 20 episodes of the dollop um and i just loved it you know um so those are probably the two 
two biggest ways it's i normally well also a lot of times um there'll be like a fan a famous person that starts mm-hmm. a podcast like i was a fan of pete holmes's comedy and then i heard he started a podcast and i kind of dove in that way so i think that works for a lot of people like you see it a lot with comedians i feel like every comedian has a podcast now well, they should <laughs> um yeah <laughs> yeah it's it's the perfect medium but um but yeah i would say those were those are probably the major ways i discover podcasts and as a listener do you have any like podcast pet peeves um it's funny uh did you see the snl episode yes. where they uh spoofed the i and so they addressed it but i uh a big a big pet peeve of mine is when they're talking the host is talking about something really like random or like dark or whatever <laughs> it's like oh this girl got like murdered and you know her parents found her like mutilated body so uh me undies you know like they go straight from like some crazy topic into like some you know, copy that they have to read for an ad. And it's just like the transition is just insane. So um, I, w- I would say that's my biggest pet peeve, but that, even that's not, it's not. That yeah. Bad. I think right now mine is that this super long intros where like, you, yeah, there's a guest coming on and you're waiting and you're waiting and you're like, how many commercials? There's like two commercials. That's weird. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I definitely don't have that problem. I keep my intros pretty yeah. brief. I, I don't need to hear my own voice. It's funny too. Like, if the podcast was just me talking, no way. It wouldn't work. I wouldn't want to do it. And I, I think it would be way less interesting. But um, going back to what I said earlier about, you know, having conversations with people, for whatever reason, that's like much easier. And a lot of times they'll say something that like sparks something in me. And so I I know just me talking is not that interesting. All I'm trying to do is kind of set the interview up so maybe you'll enjoy it more. But yeah, I, I completely agree with you. It's funny too. Um, especially when uh, hosts have the exact same like sponsors or whatever, yeah. and they just say the same thing each intro over and over. That's, that's not good. Yeah. It was like, like Casper mattresses and Squarespace and it's always the same people. Yeah. Stamps.com yeah. <laughs> blue apron. Mm-hmm. What are some other good ones? This is like fun. What are like the go-to Gosh, like I know podcast I mean. sponsors? I want to say like, I know I feel like there's more than GoDaddy. Every, I mean, GoDaddy did everything. Oh, uh-huh. yeah. Oh, Squarespace. Squarespace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Squarespace. Yep, Everyone's yep. sponsored by Squarespace. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah totally. And I feel like me undies is huge. Oh, the cash app. A lot of big, big podcasts yeah. are sponsored by the cash app. Well, I think um, there's a guy here in town that does um, a podcast called Dented Dimension. And it's like a kind of fictional mm-hmm. weird universe kind of thing. And he's actually had some fake commercials at the end. <laughs> That's really so like, cool. Like I like um, a parody of one. Of, I forget which one it was. I want to say it was like a meal kit. That's really funny. I kind of had a similar idea. Um, it's funny. There's this studio. It's called Earwig Studio, and it keeps coming up a lot in my interviews because a lot of my friends record there. And I was uh, talking to Don, who is the guy that runs it, and I was like, "Dude, like you almost like owe me like a sponsorship <laughs> because we like promote your show so much," and then. It's funny because there's this um, like quickie mart next door called uh, Dern Good Grocery. There's a shout out for you. But um, it's run by this uh, Korean family that doesn't speak English very well. And anytime I'm at a studio session, I always like go over there and get like beer or snacks or whatever. And I was like, Don, what do you think about me like creating a fake commercial for Dern Good Grocery? Like mm-hmm. they don't even like need to know about it. Like they it was like but i'll I'll be nice yeah totally you know totally. it'll be this like inside joke but i don't get anything out of it they don't even know it ha- and then i kind of talk myself out of it i was like what's the, what is the point of that i don't want <laughs> no, I, I love the idea of doing like fake commercials for good places yeah yeah i totally it's, dig that that'd be great one other thing i started um doing a little bit too is the um promo swapping that that's pretty cool because it's sort of like doing uh an ad but it's for like another podcast that you either like or is local and it's it's cool to kind of like help the community in that way so i've been Mm -hmm. doing that a little bit and so that's kind of been what i've been putting like in place of ads and i think that's been really great and are you putting those at the beginning of your show like or at the very end yeah um it's a that's a good question. I try to honor them by <laughs> by doing it after my intro and before the uh, yeah. interview because I feel like it will get heard. Um, when I've swapped with a couple people, I was kind of disappointed to be honest because like they just sort of tack it on at the very end. They don't even like 
mention it or put it in any sort of context. It's just sort of there. And I mean, I don't know. I'm not knocking it. It's fine. Like, do what you're going to do. That's mm-hmm. totally fine. But like, for me, it's like, I want to honor that and kind of, you know, really sort of put it in context and let it have its moment and kind of give it the best chance it, it can to be heard mm-hmm. and be, totally. you know, consumed. So, yeah, I, I, I'm i going to go on record. That's another pet peeve of mine. <laughs> <laughs> and just tack it on the promo at the very end. And it's like, mm-hmm. well, because people just tune out, you know, and if they don't even know like what, it, what it is, cause you haven't mentioned it. I don't know. I just feel like you're kind of, it, you've lost before you've begun almost. It's a source of a lot of drama. If you go on to the, uh, those Facebook groups, people. Oh, really? Go, oh yeah. Well, cause like they also want to be like, they want like an equivalency and they want to say, well, I have like this many, uh, this audience. So like you have this audience, so it's not really fair. And I'm like, well, is oh, it really wow. not being fair? It's, like if you like that show, why not promote it? Yeah, it's funny. I must be too new. I haven't run into that, and I've just been trying to do local podcasts as well. Um, like yeah. people I met from the the guild. Yeah, that's gonna be way stuff. better. Yeah. yeah, but how do people even know how many listeners other podcasts have? It's um, it's mostly ego. From what so <laughs> I'm just saying, what like the Facebook drama I've seen. Sure, <laughs> it's mostly ego. They just assume that because of Twitter followers or whatever, or whatever they oh. want to say that they're of a higher standard yeah. than this other person. So therefore I think maybe they want like a maybe monetary compensation, but that's not really hmm. a swap then. Am I allowed to ask you questions? Yes. <laughs> you think of something. So what do you, what do you think about that? Especially when it comes to like social media, like let's say Twitter, for example, D- do you believe that Twitter followers equate to an audience? Cause that has not been no, no, my no. experience. No, no, not at all. I, I just was writing a thing today about how, um, so I, I do a bunch of different podcasts over the time and like, I have one person I use an example, I don't say their name, but you know, they had, you know, like a hundred thousand followers and you know, it was kind of, I didn't do my research to know that most of them were fake. Yeah. So even though they're like kind of prominent in this community, but you know, their, their tweets are getting like maybe one or two likes. Yeah. And it's like, well, it's all about the engagement. Like yeah. can, it's that engagement. That's another big thing I learned um, from music that's a parallel with podcasts because there's a lot of these like quote unquote PR firms out there. Yeah. If you want to get like, oh, a hundred listens on Spotify, or if you want to get your uh, album reviewed on these blogs, you know, yeah. you pay like thousands of dollars and you get you know, these reviews from blogs that no one's ever heard of that it's just like dudes in their like mom's basement or something where it's like nothing or they get these like digital, like um, digital plays like on internet radio stations that no one's listening to the people a lot of times and this is definitely true in podcasts. It's like they get more hooked on the numbers than the engagements. Like you said, it's it's really about um so, so I subscribe or I don't subscribe. I um, host my site through Libsyn mm-hmm. and they do their own podcast, which is about podcasting. I, I don't think it's a, a rival to you. I think you're saying, I don't oh, no, no. The, 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 feed, the feed is great. Yeah. The feed. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and Rob on that has always said, you know, it's not about listens. It's about listeners. Yeah. And I think that's so true. It's like you can get some dude in India to hit the button yeah, to play totally. your episode a million times, but he's not really listening to it. He's not engaged. It doesn't matter. You know, it's like it's I, I found it's much better to have a hundred people who actually listen to your podcast, enjoy it and engage with mm-hmm. it than like a thousand people who aren't even paying attention. Yep. And yeah, it's the, the feeling you get from people interacting with you genuinely from your show is amazing. Mm-hmm. And like, I see a lot of people faking it and like, I just wonder how they feel. Yeah. I don't know. I, I think, I think there's a constant like scarcity feeling in their heart maybe. And they're, they're feel like they're always scrounging. I mean, I have a little bit of pity for them, but they yeah. also kind of make the industry um, not very fun because a lot of advertisers see that and they don't know really how to judge a podcast, right? And yeah. so a lot of times they just judge based on the Twitter followers. Yeah. And it's That's really funny. unfair and um, frustrating. This just happened in the music community. Do you did, did you hear the story of uh Threaten? That nope. the okay, I'll make it really fast. So <laughs> there was this um guy who started a metal band called Threaten, and he did exactly what we're talking about right now. He bought a ton of YouTube views and oh, yeah. bought a ton of social media followers. 
and um, was able to book a European tour Ooh. all based on these numbers. And they show up and there's literally no one in the audience. <laughs> and this happens like two or three times on the tour and the club owners start to get wise to it and they start seeing where he's going to be next and like emailing and contacting the venues being like, hey, this guy is like not the real deal. And it's just like, and it totally blew up in his face. It was really funny. Um, there's like a bunch of articles about it and like YouTube videos and stuff. And it's it's really funny, but it goes exactly to what we're talking to where it's like, you can buy followers, you can buy listens, but it's, it's so hollow. You know, there's mm-hmm. nothing to it. It's not really even helping you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's that the idea of like, fake it till you make it, but that works good like internally. Yeah. But when you do that externally, that's a whole other thing. Yeah. And I I think when it comes to something as like personal as, as podcasts, it's like if a podcast has a million listeners, that doesn't mean that doesn't make me go, Oh, I should listen to this. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like podcasts are so niche and personal. It's like, it's really like about what you're into. And I just feel like the numbers, they don't really, I mean, I guess maybe like you were saying, it helps fool advertisers for a little while, Mm -hmm. but I just feel like that is just going to blow up in your face. Yeah, well, because then they, so I think actually maybe, I might be confusing, but I think Rob on uh, the feed talked about how um, people were kind of being tricked Mm -hmm. by fake downloads and it kind of affected their CPMs of what they thought they were getting. It was a whole disaster, but that kind of thing where you, it's a whole bunch of fake downloads and they're expecting on their spreadsheet to get this much return from the ads Mm -hmm. and they don't. It's because there's just so much fraud going on. Yeah. And I don't think people realize how much fraud there is in podcasting. There, there's quite a bit. I, I have just stopped a, a cryptocurrency podcast that I was doing for a little while. And th- that is a, a very dirty, dirty area of podcasting. Oh, really? Yes. Yeah. I mean, that's a place where people will come to you where they want to pay, pay you to do the interview. And then you have like these recruiters who will be like, here's, here, I had this one guy come to me and he's like, so here's the deal. I've got a system. And basically, you know, I'll take a percentage of what they pay you to be interviewed. And then we'll use the rest of the money to buy followers and then we'll charge more for the next person. Wow. And it's like, that oh my gosh. Like, <laughs> that sounds like the mob or something where like everyone yeah. gets their cut and it's just all like smoke and mirrors. Yeah. Yeah. God, totally. It sounds yeah. so yeah. dirty. No wonder there's so many podcasts about entrepreneurship. That yeah. 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 All yeah like I was doing ties in. Yeah. I was doing it because I like, like the technology, but I eventually kind of stopped because I'm like, it's just too, too weird like yeah. I, I met like a handful of really cool people but like a lot of people were just yeah not very fun <laughs> yeah sounds depressing i'm not surprised yeah, that's like, why i'm doing this now i gotta talk to awesome people here in seattle in my home and uh connect with people who actually have a passion about things yeah exactly well let's see um do you have any predictions for 2019 for podcasting I think it's just going to get bigger and bigger, to be honest with you. And I'm not just saying that because I'm, you know, in the game or whatever it is. Like, I really feel that podcasting is like the ultimate freedom. Like, you can say whatever you want and put it out there. You know, it's like, I just, I don't even understand why anyone listens to terrestrial radio anymore. Like, why? Like, (laughs) yeah, seriously, like, what, what is anyone doing that is not done better either on a podcast or if it's music, like, um, yeah, you can get any music that's ever existed ever on your phone. Like, you know, especially like being a rock guy, you know, I'd listen to like one Oh seven, the end. And it's like, they just play, you know, like Nirvana and Alice in Chains. And it's like, I've already heard this like a million (laughs) times, you know? Yeah. But so I, I think just more and more people are going to get into podcasts. I think it's going to grow and just become more mainstream. I mean, you're already seeing it with like the SNL skit, you know, it's, it's Mm -hmm. still kind of funny. I think in a lot of people's minds, podcasting is still sort of underground. Um, I remember when I started podcasting, uh, one thing that kind of surprised me was, uh, you know, if I talked to 10 people, maybe like two or three would be like, what's a podcast. And I was just like, wow, really? Uh, Like, okay. Like, you know, I didn't expect my grandma to know what a podcast is, but like, you know, uh, up here, I was like, yeah, this is like the thing, you know, it's like on your phone and it's, you know, like music and it's just so easy to get. And, you know, <laughs> I mean, the people that it's funny, I'm like saying what a podcast is and everyone who's listening to this knows what a podcast is. Like, yeah, guys, it's like in your phone. <laughs> really helping out here. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. Where can people find your show? 
Yeah, I mean, um, I I haven't found. I, I mean, how should I say this? Every app that I'm aware of that has podcasting, I am on. So that would be, you know, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Podcast, um, Overcast, which I think is just an uh, outsourced version of uh, iTunes or Apple Podcasts. Um, I think those are the main ones. Um, I'm hosted through Libsyn, so if you wanted to hear it straight from the source, uh, the website's just uh, solvingsounds.libsyn.com. Yeah. The- All right. Awesome. I'll make sure we have uh, some of those links in the uh, show notes. Thanks again for coming on. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. This was really fun. Thanks again, Brent, for coming to the show. Your attitude and positivity was just infectious. It really gave me a lot of energy. It was a great conversation. I really appreciate you taking a chance and coming on the show, telling us about your process and why you do what you do and just podcasting in general. Um, Thank you so much. Um, You've been listening to the Seattle Podcasters podcast. I've been your host, Jason Rigdon, and uh, I hope to talk to you again soon. The Seattle Podcasters podcast is a production of the Seattle Podcasters Guild. You can find more information about the Seattle Podcasters Guild or this podcast by visiting seattlepodcasters.com. This show has been hosted and produced by me, Jason Rigdon. Our theme song was Stringed Disco by Kevin McLeod. Incompetech.com, licensed under creative.